accept responsibility for the catastrophe of your life and that way you transcend it simultaneously and there's, a, there's an unbelievably hopeful message in there and the message is you're actually strong enough to do that you just don't know it and you won't find out till you do it you can't find out till you do it but if you did it you'd find out that it was true it's a massive risk it's the ultimate in risks right you have to be willing to lose your life in order to find it it's like exactly right so that picture when I started to understand that picture well every time I look at it, it just blows me away I can't it's, it's unbelievably it's an unbelievably sophisticated set of ideas but I don't think it's much different really than this idea I mean Buddha finds his enlightenment under a tree it's not fluke that that's the case that's his natural environment and he's sitting in the lotus here the lotus opens up it's th this thing that springs up from the depths and he sits there illuminated the same way he's got a halo that's the sun that stands for higher consciousness and he's, he's transcended by accepting the fact that life is suffering he's transcended the limitations that are part of mortality you see that symbol there that swastika, you see it there, it's reversed. The Nazis reversed it. Well, think about that. I mean, they weren't stupid. Their symbolism, their symbols had meaning. Is what the swastika were represented was what this represents reversed. Well, that's a very bad idea. This is the thing that this this idea is what enables people to transcend their suffering. And Buddha said, Well, don't don't be too attached to things. And what does that mean? It doesn't mean deny the world. It might mean deny the world if you're too in love with the material, like with material well-being, let's say, then your pathway to transcendence and meaning might be to abandon that because it's, it's constraining you. It's making you less than you could be. But the, the fundamental lesson, the more fundamental lesson that's underneath that is don't let what you are stop you from being what you could be. Right. And so then the question is, well, what do you identify with? Do you identify with what you are? Then you're a tyrant. Do you identify with, with chaos? Because that's the opposite of order, say. Then you're a nihilistic. Well, you don't identify with either of those. You, you know that they're both necessary. You know that you have to live with both of them. But you, would, you identify with the capacity to continually transcend what you are. And then you seek out error. That's what humility is. It's like, I'm error-ridden. It's like, so I want to see. I want to put myself in a situation where I can discover one of my errors. Hopefully not in a way that's going to knock me completely out of the game, right? I, I, want, to, I want to seek out a challenge. I want to find out where my limits are. I want to find out where there's not enough of me yet. And I want to do it, that in a way that's engaging. Because, you know, you can wear yourself out fighting dragons, obviously. You can exhaust yourself completely, and that's not helpful. You know, one, one of the things I learned, for example, when I was coaching, when I was coaching lawyers, who these were people who had very high-end careers, and so they had an infinite workload, no matter how much they worked, flat out, there was always way more work that they should do. It's a very difficult thing to learn to manage. And so they were exhausting themselves, and, and I said, well, you know, you have to work less per day. It's like, well, no, that's not happening. I, I can't do that. And so... Well, the, what I learned over time was, okay, so this is what you have to do. Every three months you have to block off four days and go have a vacation. And you have to plan that in advance so it's in your calendar so that your secretary doesn't book your time. And then you need that because you have to recuperate enough so that you can work as hard as you're going to work. And of course they were nervous about that. And I said, well look, we can, we can calibrate this. Let's keep track of your billable hours over the next year and see if they increase or decrease. Because I bet you if you take more time off, you'll actually have more billable hours. You'll actually have your cake and eat it too. You'll get to have a vacation and you'll be more productive. And that inevitably that was what happened. And so that's a matter of calibrating the game properly, right? You want to play a game that you can play today, but also one that you can play next week and next month. We're not talking about, you know, your your career this week. We're talking about you having a career that lasts 30 years, that doesn't kill you, that doesn't make you hate yourself or the job, that doesn't make you bitter, that doesn't wear you to a frazzle. So we, it has to be optimized. And so I think that you can, in fact, decide to take on the load that's optimally meaningful if you want, and then you get to have your cake and eat it too. You're 
on the pathway to continual incremental improvement, you only have to burn off a feather at a time instead of having the whole bloody thing burst into flames. But it's a constant, it's a constant source of renewal. And there's an idea that to be renewed, you have to drink the water of life, right? That, that, that's an old mythological idea. And what's the water? The water of life, chaos is water. Water, water is chaos. Water is what washes away too much order. And to stay continually, let's say, uh, um, refreshed by the water of life is to take on exactly the right amount of chaos to make sure that your garden is properly nourished. And I think meaning is actually the marker of that.